Okay. The meeting to order, please. Mike, can you call us? Ms. Benecki. Present. Dr. Brown. Here. Mr. Ashton Clark. Here. Ms. Hope. Here. Ms. Hollingworth. Here. Mr. Knuckles. Here. Ms. Paoli. Here. Vice President Hogro. Here. And President Booker. Please stand. Please public notice of this meeting pursuant to the open public meetings act has been given by the superintendent of schools in the following matter on january 10th 2023 notice of this meeting was posted on the interior of the school administration offices 95 Grove Street, Haddonfield. Written notice was submitted and filed with the Haddonfield Borough Clerk, and notices were emailed to the Courier Post and the Retrospect newspaper. Do okay. we have any student accommodations? We do not. Okay. Um, and we have a, a new board representative tonight, Paige. Mm -hmm. Welcome. And do you have a report for us? I do. So I'm Paige, just to introduce myself. I'm one of the new board reps. So starting off with the sports summary, for our basketball team, the boys just won their playoff game at 5 o'clock, and the girls are playing now. Swimming has their state final on Saturday. Track won the state championship, and wrestling won the sectional championship for the first time in school history. The peer leader program, which is a program we have here at HMHS for juniors and seniors to kind of help the underclassmen adjust and kind of learn the lay of the land at HMHS. Uh, the applications come out tomorrow and interviews start in March and people who were selected will be notified in the beginning of April. We have NJSLA testing coming up for juniors, which is just a form of state testing. We have our musical also for the school, which is coming up in March and just kind of giving a re recap on midterms. They went very smoothly. We had therapy dogs in auditoriums in between the morning and the <laughs> sessions, which were very popular. Um, and a lot of students do seem to like the new schedule, giving four days instead of three. So you have one period for each of your midterms, which gives students more study time if they have a period off. Uh, our third marketing period has started, and that kind of means we're over halfway through the school year. Our senior trip is coming up. We have German, German exchange students here now, and our intramural basketball program is um, in playoffs, and the championship is coming up, I think, either this week or next week. And it's been very well liked, very popular, and it's been a lot of fun. That's all. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we have um, two presentations tonight. The first one, the Jewish American Cultural Club. <coughs> <coughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Charlotte Berman, founder and president of the HMHS Jewish American Cultural Club. Two weeks ago, 50 students and faculty from Haddonfield Memorial High School visited the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. On the trip, all affinity groups from the high school had representation, which shows how all 50 students and faculty of all backgrounds engaged in Holocaust education. This trip could not have been possible without the Jewish Community Relations Council and the Esther Robb Holocaust Museum and Goodwin Education Center. We cannot thank you enough. The reason we are here tonight is to speak to one of the district's goals, promoting a student's sense of belonging. I've lived in Haddonfield since I was two years old. I've had my Haddonfield life and my Jewish life outside of town. I've witnessed some anti-Semitism over the years. But when my brother found a swastika on the HMS playground last spring, I knew that something had to be done. Mrs. Hughes and I spoke about starting a Jewish cultural club in response. The club started with just four student officers and eventually grew to over 80 members with an average of 30 participants at each event. I am pleasantly surprised and excited with our success. We have managed to create a safe place for students to connect and have a fun and engaging club for Jewish and non-Jewish students to celebrate the culture through sharing personal experiences, participating in holiday inspired activities and eating traditional foods. We've even been featured in the Jewish Community Voice publication for our efforts. I never thought that I could have a Jewish connection in Haddonfield. 
It was always something that took place elsewhere. I have left every JACC meeting knowing that we are doing something good. And if sharing our, our culture and traditions can help educate and reduce ignorance and hate in some small way, then our efforts are truly worthwhile. One of the club's main goals is to achieve the Jewish concept of tikkun olam, which in English means repairing the world. The trip to the Holocaust Museum and the other memorial sites achieves tikkun olam by spreading awareness about not only the Jewish struggle, but also all human suffering. We believe we can repair the world starting with Haddonfield. The following statement from Ian Talti, a non-Jewish JACC member, models this concept. I think that as somebody who isn't Jewish, it is important to seize whatever opportunities I can to increase my understanding of anti-Semitism and its larger historical roots to make myself better equipped to deal with anti-Semitism that I witness. The Holocaust is one of the heaviest topics a person is exposed to, but its significance is why I believe everybody has an obligation to learn about it, no matter how hard. I don't think this trip, I don't think this trip will be easy or necessarily fun, but I think that it will help me in the future. Sometimes I think that there's a conflict between doing what's right and what's easy, especially when it comes to hearing jokes from classmates. And I think that the simple gravity of something like the Holocaust Memorial is something like is something that can completely change is something that can completely change one's perspective and make somebody realize the individual's importance of stepping up and speaking out. <coughs> it was our hope to make this trip as inclusive as possible for people wishing to attend. Students represented included the Jewish American Cultural Club, Asian American Cultural Club, Black Student Union, Gender Sexuality Alliance, Hispanic and Latino Cultural Club, World Language Clubs, History Club, Anti-Bias Leaders, and the Holocaust Collective. Even though just one or two people from each household could go to the museum, the trip goers are now able to share that information with people from their households and their family. And then their family is able to spread that information to their friends. And then those friends are able to share that beyond the community. When these experiences are continuously shared, the people who are informed about the Holocaust grows exponentially. Um, for example, students such as Moira Geiger, a senior anti-bias leader, Spanish language club member and equity summit participant, and Asher Fred, a sophomore and Asian American cultural club member, both felt the impact of the U United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and are here to share with us their reflections. Visiting the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and other memorial sites was the most impactful trip I've ever gone on for having field schools. Learning about these events in a classroom does not resonate with you to the same extent as seeing the artifacts in front of your own eyes and listening to the stories of the people who experienced them. I found myself getting lost in the vast amounts of information in front of me and the emotions I had to process. Never had these historical tragedies felt so real to me like they did upon visiting the museum. This trip makes you reevaluate re your perceptions of hate and inequality, and the message of taking action is one I wish to spread it within my own community. There's so much to learn about not only the Holocaust, but in humanity itself, and this trip will forever stay with me. Hi, everyone. I'm Asher Fred, a sophomore at HMHS and also an Asian American Cultural Club member. Visiting the Holocaust Museum and the other memorial sites in Washington, D.C. was an experience that I'll never forget. As a student in Hadfield, a largely sheltered and self-enclosed community, it was eye-opening to visualize the story of the Holocaust in a way I'd never done before. The museum helped me appreciate the power of stories and their power to help us see the world through the eyes of others. This experience gave me countless eyes to see through, endless lenses that helped me understand this horrific stain on our history. To anyone visiting the museum for the first time, this experience will forever change the way you see the Holocaust. While it is difficult to revisit this atrocity, we must never forget the past and we must never repeat it again. Thank you, Maura and Asher. Before we close, we would like to thank the Jewish Community Relations Council and the Rob Goodwin Center again for their support and providing this opportunity at, at no cost to our students. If you're interested in learning more about Holocaust education, please reach out to Executive Director David Snyder or Helen Kirschbaum to coordinate a visit to the Rob Goodwin Holocaust Museum at the JCC. Lastly, before you leave tonight, please take a look at the JACC Holocaust Remembrance Wall in the center of the library. It is a very powerful testimony, and many students here at HMHS worked hard to install this memorial. Thank you so much to our peers for showing up to our events, 
and everyone who comes out to support these, these efforts. We really appreciate the Board of Ed for taking the time to elevate student work and promote a sense of belonging. Thank you for your, thank you all for your time. Thank you all very much. That, that's really wonderful. You've done this wonderful thing. You create this club and kudos to all of you. Great presentation. Sure. Okay, Mike, you have a preliminary budget presentation for us. I do. With your fancy new technology. Yes. <laughs> All right, so tonight is our uh, tentative budget presentation for fiscal year 2024. Uh, before I start, I actually want to thank all those involved. Uh, there's more than just me in the budget process, uh, specifically our administrators. Um, careful, Mike. Sorry. Uh, um, the, the administrators, they're the ones that, that from the foundation start all the compilation that is uh, provided through the budget. Um, they do a fantastic job doing it. And, because they do a fantastic job doing it, it makes my job a lot easier. So uh, real kudos to our, our administrators. So here's what we're gonna to cover tonight. Uh, we'll talk about our timeline, where we've been, where we are, where we're going. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a few highlights of uh, our key points of the budget. We'll talk about the numbers, and then of course we'll talk about some factors and challenges we face during the budget process. So here is the timeline of events of where we are with the budget. So back in October, the board uh, uh, the board approves our internal calendar of the budget process. Um, and then from there, that's where the administrators, they, they start their job in actually compiling by building department while their budgets for next year. Um, then we all meet, we, uh, we meet with uh, Chuck, you know, and myself talk about our budgets. They talk about challenges they face, um, not only challenges, but possible save where they can help us find savings. Um, and also they talk about the initiatives that they would love to implement in the following year. Um, uh, and then right after that, we have our current year budget freeze. That's on February 1st. And what that does is we freeze our budget with the exception of a, a lot of areas. Student activities continues, uh, child study team. Uh, purchases continues. But what that does is that gives us the ability to pick, uh, give, uh, so we can picture um, our fiscal year end that year uh, so we can get a good idea where we're going to end financially um, by by June 30th. Okay. And then um, we're here tonight, February 23rd. That's tonight. Uh, so you, as you can see, we're in the middle of this process somewhere, right? Now, where we go after tonight is next week the governor has his budget message on the 28th and then uh, two days later that's when we're supposed to find out our state aid numbers okay now there is a date on here march 16th that is our march work session now this is an if this is an if statement okay so the only reason we would ever we would have to take action that night uh to reapprove this tentative budget the only reason that would have to happen is if we experience a state aid decrease, which right now we have no reason to believe we're going to see a decrease in state aid. Okay, so that's an if. That's only if necessary. All right now, if we don't uh, receive a decrease in state aid, um, we we submit our budget to the county. That's that's this next uh, this next point here, and then statutorily April twentieth 
the executive county superintendent, they, they, um, their approval is due back to us, and then we'll come back here. We'll have our public meeting, uh, our public hearing on the on the 27th to adopt the budget. Um, and then you can see the statutory uh, deadline to adopt the budget. And then July 1st, we implement the budget. All right, so these are some uh, key points in uh, what we have tried to accomplish with the budget. Of course, uh, we, uh, the budget is an expression of our, our needs, our priorities, and our mission. Um, we support our goals, which feeds to our, our mission, right? And that's something we, we have to accomplish every year, and we certainly accomplish that in this year's budget and the budget that we'll be presenting tentatively tonight and hopefully adopting uh, in April. Uh, the, this next point is uh, ma maintaining everything that we're doing. We're not cutting anything. It's something nice to say. We're not reducing anything. Um, just uh, and what we're not reducing are things. This next point: uh, things that we had to implement during COVID were we kept in the budget. Um, uh, for example, COVID really boosted our one-to-one -one initiative by about two years, um, and it's nice that we have our steady rotation now. Uh, of, of our one-to-one -one initiative for all the devices for our students. Um, and of course, we keep uh, contractual obligations and we have capital improvements uh, budgeted in this budget. Now, definition of capital improvements for this budget, what falls under what we're funding capital reserve. Obviously, earlier this month, we had a special meeting to approve the agreement of sale for previously known Kingsway Learning Center. That's being funded by capital reserve. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's that's the under definition of capital improvement. That's what we're funding. Okay. All right. I call this the fun slide. This is what we're adding, right? Um, so we're excited to announce that we're going to be budgeting uh, to hire three brand new content area supervisors. Um, and then we're also funding the compensation needed to uh, have a, a math committee. So strong focus on the academic area with these first two new additions. Um, and then on the, on the other side of operations, we're, we're due for a new bus. I have 42 to, uh, sorry, 48 to 52 passenger bus. That's what we have to uh, the budget for. We have a bus that is legally, we have to take out of rotation. It's 13 years old. We can't use anything older than that. So we have to have a new bus. Um, now there is a notice. There's sort of a void at the bottom of this. That's in, that's intended. That's intended because we get a lot of budget initiatives from our administrators on things that they believe we need. Not so much we want things we need, but we talk a lot about fiscal responsibility. We would love to add everything that our administrators need to help to help run our district. But unfortunately, we just can't say yes to everything. So we we have our meetings, we discuss this, we prioritize. This is what we're adding. But I'd like to highlight some of the things that we are saying no to. Um, first and foremost, for a couple of years now, at the elementary level, we've had the 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 request for a math interventionist. It's a really strong something, it's something we really need at our elementary level. Fortunately, we can't just we can't. Uh, make it work for next year. On top of that, there's 18 other personnel requests that we got during this this budget this budget round. Just to put that in perspective, uh, perspective, it's about 1.5 million dollars in ask. 18 personnel. Also, in, in uh, all the initiatives that the administrators brought to us, it's over 100 thousand dollars in athletic uh, ask that they that they had. Um, also included more extracurricular stipends and more compensation for work that we do over summer. That's what we unfortunately could not move forward to implement and add new to next year's budget. Okay. And this is what we're continuing to do. Uh, Promethean panels. Uh, currently we have 115 classrooms with interactive boards like the ones you see here. Um, we have about 60 classrooms left that we want to add these uh, this equipment to. Um, we were hoping to tackle at least a, a third of those 60, but these things, when we first started buying them, they're about $5,000. Now they're like about $8,000. So, I mean, do that times, just do the math. I mean, that's 
we try and cover them all. That's the sixty thousand dollar increase in what we're trying to trying to cover. Uh, if we're trying to uh, cover twenty of them, uh, continuing one to one initiative. I mentioned that earlier. Um, it's been about four years since we had covered grades three through twelve with our one to one initiative. Uh, uh, furniture for flexible learning uh, district wide. Let past a uh, few years, Dr. Grill has done a fantastic job uh, taking grade levels at a time and implementing uh, adding new furniture into classroom. Next year, we're supposed to tackle fourth grade. Uh, and then, of course, we're, curri uh, we're continuing curriculum writing and our 18 to 21 program, which we just started this year. That's what we're continuing for next year. All right. This is a budget presentation, so I have to show you numbers, right? Um, so 50, 50 million, this is our total budget. Our operating budget of that 50 million is $46 million. Capital outlay, that is the capital reserve withdrawal I was hinting to earlier to fund the purchase of previously uh, formerly known Kingsway Learning Center, okay? And then Fund 20, these are our grants, IDA and ESS, ESSA grants. <coughs> these are federal grants. I'd like to point out that IDA, first off, from a budgeting standpoint, the, the budget guidelines uh, require us to budget 85% of our primary allocation. This isn't what our grant uh, allocations are going to be next year, just a little disclosure. But that's, that's, that's the rule that the, the Department of Education gives us when budgeting the federal grants. Also, I'd like to point out, two years ago, this would have said titles two, one, two, and four. Sorry, one, two, and four. Now it just says title two. The reason that we do not have title one or four anymore is because the driver to that grant is low-income population. We Our low-income population is too low. We are, we are now ineligible for title one. And most recently this year, title four. Okay, so no, uh, that's why you don't see Title One or Title Four there anymore. <clears throat> Student activity funds, we had to start budgeting that in the special revenue fund a couple of years ago due to Gadsby 75. And uh, this is that's the budget amount of activity we have between our elementary, middle school, high school, and athletics activity accounts. Fund 40 debt service, that's us paying off our debt from voter approved referendums. Went down by only $30,000 from this year to next year. There's no changing of that number. That's that's concrete, okay? All right, so this paints the picture. This is the operating budget that we just looked at, that $46 million. As you can see, salaries and benefits, that's that's over 75% of the pie. That's, that's part of the message we try and show um, when, when showing this. Uh, is there a difference from last year? Not really. If anything, probably the professional services piece of the pie, but not slightly. That's about it. Everything else is basically the same as far as the proportionate share of each of these categories within the operating budget. All right, so lastly, just a couple factors, challenges we face overall with our budget. As I just explained, payroll and benefits is a huge part of the pie, right? Um, that, are, those are our two biggest bills, payroll and benefits. Uh, they're increasing at a rate of 5% combined from last year, the year we're in right now, to what we're budgeting next year. Um, that's tough, but you know, people are the, the, the most expensive, the, the biggest investment that we can have, and that's probably the, the best investment we can make, and that's the best investment for, for our students. So we're investing in our teachers. Um, the 2% tax levy cap. So let me talk about this one a little more uh, in detail, more than what's just on this slide. So as you can see, 2% of our tax levy, that is what the board technically votes on to approve, and 2% is our, our cap, okay? We're not allowed to go over, uh, over 2%. There's only uh, a, a couple of reasons we can. One, we go to a voter, voter uh, referendum. Or two, you're allowed to uh, insert bank capped years uh, from years you did not go to 2%. You're allowed to bank that pot of money and use it for later years 
uh, tax levy increases. We do not have any bank cap. But you can see here, for the first time in four years, we're actually eligible for an enrollment adjustment. So what happens in, in the budget software, uh, and there's, number, there's numbers taken from every, uh, the ASSA process, okay? So with the ASSA process, that's application for state school aid. Every October, we submit to the state of New Jersey what our enrollment numbers are. And there are certain categories for, you know, if there's LEP students, if there are low income eligible students, and based on your enrollment numbers and the certain categories, determines your state aid. That's what we're gonna find out next week. Now, the budget software allows us to project our enrollment, but also accounts for what our enrollment reported to the state was that October. So this past October, we actually went up about 2% in enrollment from at our ASSA from, from this past October and the October before. Based on projections, we're actually eligible, again, for this enrollment adjustment, which allows us to go over 2%. If, if the state allow, if a state allows us, and according to the to the state, we are allowed to. Okay. So then, in, in, in terms of money, that's one hundred and sixteen thousand um, dollars. Percentage wise, if we took that, that's a total of two point three percent increase on the tax levy. Okay. Another source of funding we've been using, we talked a lot about ESSER funding. That's that, that, that acronym, that's what it stands for, Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds. So there's, there's three allocations for that money. So far, we've been spending it. You're approving a, a construction contract tonight that's gonna spend a substantial amount of that money. Um, we have to spend all that money by uh, September 2024. Um, why that's here is, it's nice to have some one-time funds in, from from the in the middle of the pandemic that we were able to tackle some of these projects. So we have those, but they're, they're eventually not going to be here, right? So, like I said, we have until this, uh, September 2024 to spend that money, uh, and that's not going to be a problem at all. We spent most of it, uh, and like I said, we're, we're approving a uh, a contract tonight that will spend a substantial amount of it uh, tonight. Uh, and then lastly, professional services. Now, it's it's no it's no it's no surprise to anyone that costs of everything have gone up, right? Not just in supplies, but services also, right? Things cost more money. Overnight last year, paper went up thirty percent for us. And we just we just <coughs> we buy it, so we're not going to stop buying paper. Um, but these costs go up for for more than than just us, right? So in turn, professional services are increasing. All right, so um, that's 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 a budgeting factor, and these things are increasing at a rate higher than this two percent uh, uh, increase that we are allowed to approve. This is this is a huge budgeting factor, right? Um, is this a, so? Every year we go through a process. Chuck Gino and I we meet with the the county uh, superintendent and the county business administrator. We have a mid year budget review. And one of the questions they asked this year is, do you see signs of a fiscal cliff? Of course we do. We can, we can only increase our tax levy 2% when everything else is increasing at a higher rate. Now, realistically, we are pretty financially healthy, which is good. But this is a sign of a fiscal cliff. There's no denying that. Okay. Um, overall, sort of getting off, off slides here, uh, I mentioned fiscal responsibility earlier. Um, you know, one thing that is that we also talk about this time of year is is tuition. Um, with our middle school and high school, we have a, a program that we have at both levels that well, what we do is we talk to the principals and say, hey, listen, it's that time of year. What do you have room for next year based on enrollment numbers? Well, they, they get back to us what they're on the grade levels, they're comfortable with us accepting tuition students for the following year. Um, and unfortunately, the last couple of years, there hasn't been much room. We're tight on space. So you know, we get a lot of applications. We're turning away revenue because we have no space. That's something very, it's something very hard to do. We're turning away money, right? Um, 
So something else I want to point out when we talk about fiscal responsibility, we're not going to put kids in a classroom when, when there's no room in that classroom. So um, that's overall, that's what, what I have. Any questions? I can certainly go back to any slide. If there's anything. How much is left of the SR funds? You know? Good question. Yeah, I was supposed to come prepared tonight, and I knew that question was going to be asked. But uh, so there's there's just three rounds of ESSER funds. There's CARES, ESSER two, and American Rescue Plan funds. We've spent all of CARES CARES money. Um, the ESSER two funds, which most of it is is getting spent, or actually the rest of it is getting spent with the the pillar renovation contract, which you guys will be voting on later tonight. That'll that'll take care of the rest of ESSER two. American Rescue Plan funds, that's the bulk of what we have left. I can't be quoted on this. It's somewhere around, probably, that's not encumbered. It won't be encumbered after this contract is approved. Probably somewhere between 500,000 to a million. Total, overall. Mike, are the Promethean boards included in that rotation you referred to earlier when talking about the Chromebooks? Or no, that, that, that was just products, the one to one devices. So, Mike, you, you talk about the, the financial cliff, which certainly, the, as, as a board and, and as we're concerned about uh, the finances, it's something for us to, to be looking at. Um, uh, when you showed the pie chart, um, you said that most of that is, is kind of the same. Uh, however, that the things probably move the most is the professional services. Mm -hmm. um, are those professional services all serving our, our kids? Is that what we're spending that money on to serve our kids? Good question. So let, let me elaborate on what like what what is professional services? What am I talking about? Professional services. So this is a wide range of things. I will say uh, I, I exclude buildings and grounds. That's its whole separate category. I want to keep the facility. Uh, uh, costs separate from everything else, but that's anywhere from your educational professional uh, services, and that could be uh, where we're hiring a, pro, uh, a vendor for professional development for our teachers. That could also be in-class support, so behavioral services, that could be outsourced evaluations, any, any type of educational services. But that's also things that we handle on the central administration level. That could be architectural services, legal services. Legal services have sort of gone up in the last couple of years, and for a few reasons. Um, but the rate that those services are increasing, again, they're, they're increasing by the rate higher than what we can, you know, what we can increase the budget by. Uh, increase the budget by, hence the fiscal cliff <coughs> realization. Uh, let me touch on legal expenses real quick. So, since uh, we'll say July 1st, 2021, our legal expenses, they've changed a bit, okay? So we often, we, th there's, there's a lot of reasons we have to reach out to legal services. Hey, I'm, I went through the whole uh, agreement of sale process that, that, was, that was legal services. We have to, we're, we're, acqu we're acquiring uh, a, a building that, that doesn't happen very often. We've got to use you know, legal services for, for real for real estate purposes um, but also when there, there's things that come to us that we have to uh, we have to answer and I, what I mean by that specifically is I'm the custodian of records also right so we get a lot of OPA requests we've been receiving a lot of OPA requests the last over, over 18 months um, some of these requests are very complicated and take up a lot of time not and not just my office sometimes. I mean, sometimes it shuts down my office because there's financial uh, requests, legal requests. There's many requests. But it can also shut down the time of a principal and sometimes a teacher. Um, and that's, that's, that's tough when you have to ask a, a teacher to do, I'm asking a teacher to do my job, but I, I, there's, there's only so much, I, there's only so far I can do with obtaining information. So what I'm getting at is the legal costs are what we pay for legal costs. But I really can't put a number that in my head I know is astronomical in the time it takes the district to, to take care of some of these requests. And I mean, just so the board knows, is I'm starting to put a system in place where I'm able to track that. 
okay? Because I can't put a number on it. Uh, but there's, it, it costs money. Time is money, right? So I'm putting a system in place where I will be able to take care of that. But just so you can see certain things that, you know, may increase an actual budget line, it is also increasing the, the time of, of, of the district. So professional services are increasing. So, so are so are our times taken elsewhere where we can't do our normal everyday jobs. Mike, to, to follow up on that, thank you so much for that explanation. Um, and thank you for, for putting a system in where you can track that time. Um, because if we are seeing, if, if this is a blip and it's an anomaly and it's gonna come back down to normal, then that's one thing. But if, if this is going to continue to escalate, um, we have administration in place to serve our children and serve the district. Um, if time is being taken away, then I think we need to be aware of how much time that is. And when we're talking financially, does, does this mean that because of all of this additional work that needs to be done, we're going to have to end up hiring more administrators so it's not taking time away from our children? I think that that's something we need to be looking at in, in the upcoming year. Yeah, a uh, large, much larger shoulders. So I'm talking like, you know, the city, the city of New York, City of Trent, I mean, they have whole departments that, that take care of just this aspect of the job. We're not large enough. So we don't have that luxury to do that. But uh, for some reason, I guess it's taken that long for us to, for the OPRA, the Open Public Records Act law to affect us the way it has some other towns or cities or boroughs. Um, and, you know, that's, that's where we're at. Yep. Thank you for keeping an eye on it. Um, Linda and Mike, are we still planning? I know we had talked about um, in finance subcommittee about doing an update to the board at some time in the next few months about the increased legal costs and the increased time <laughs> that it's taking from our administrators doing, as you said, what they would otherwise do in hand student services and monitor education. Um, is that still the plan? Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about it. I mean, this was a good part of our conversation on. On Tuesday, okay. the and I apologize because I know. Um, but um, you know, we, we got we got into more detail there, of okay. course. But uh, you know, we, we wanted to. I wanted to say something about that tonight. Okay. Um, so yes, and just so you know, like there, it's a long time. If we don't have that meeting on the sixteenth, it's a long time until April twenty seventh. We'll certainly give updates here and there. Maybe the Superintendent Klaus and myself will give updates, um, and, and uh, uh, Greg through. Finance committee uh, reporting on that, where we are with the budget process. One, one final thing for me, I, I know that it's tough when you look at you know having to, to turn down things that um, that are I'm, I'm sure are <clears throat> valuable requests, um, but knowing that the fact that focus is on academics and that's where we're putting any new money that we're spending is on academics. I, I think that is in line with where the board wants to. Yeah. Yeah. The bus is compliant with the law. Can't have a bus that's over 13 years old. <laughs> Rest is academics. Yes. Any other questions? We do it the old bus. Uh, I should sell it. <laughs> I sell it. I sell it. Uh, hopefully, it's a future like Eagles Party bus or something. <laughs> that's what happens with these things. That's why you see some like uh, old Atlantic City jitneys. You know, you sell them and go with the old. So that's how we do it. And we're actually going out, Mike and I are exploring. Uh, grant opportunities for electric bus. Mm -hmm. So right now, um, they have they have opportunities. And I, I talked to one company, and it says, in essence, they they lease it to you, but they run the electric for you, they put it, they set it all up, and so it's, it's like a one package deal. So we're, we're talking to some companies, they'll help the grant writing because they make money off of this, right? So we're gonna to try to do that as well. So hopefully we can, we can put that in place. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I think a really great thing to do mm -hmm. environmentally, but also if we can save the district a couple of dollars doing it, right. that's a win-win. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah, we, uh, we have the cost of, well, I guess I'll call it an old-fashioned budget, <laughs> budget, but if we can, in turn, instead spend little or nothing on a new bus, that, that'd be fantastic. And I will I will say, uh, uh, Sharon McCullough, the borough administrator, she's been really good. Some uh, great opportunities come her way, and she sends them to Chuck. And I'm so I had to thank her, because she, She's keeping, uh, she's aware of the fact that we're looking for an opportunity like that. How much is a bus? Just like your <laughs> Well, uh, a, 40, a 48 to 52 passenger bus now, probably somewhere between, I'm giving you a wide range, probably yeah. somewhere between 125 and 150. Wow. All right. Yeah. 
the last bus we bought was three years ago. We got it for about 112. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. I hope you appreciate my effective use of technology too. Thank you. Very <laughs> <much>. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on to Councilor Lewis. Uh, to committee reports. Uh, is, is somebody going to do curriculum for Jamie? I was in it, but I didn't know we were going to talk on it, yeah. so I don't have any organized notes on it. I can yeah. look at the. Um, oh, she's going to take the next uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> You want to come up with we'll pack that? Let's okay, let's okay. okay. All right. Finance and facilities? Finance is easy because Michael just said the whole thing. All right, I'm trying to stretch here. Well, I'm going to look short because it's going to happen now. Okay. Um, long range facilities, we have a meeting next week. Uh, student Life Committee, we we met. met. <laughs> yep, we met and shared a trying here last week. How about PTA update? We did <laughs> I think we did that last week, and Central is not for another week, so Central Elementary. So stay tuned. Did my best. Sorry, I right. know where you're going. Two weeks in a row, an impromptu. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I get some grace. So, uh, so this month's agenda, uh, we spoke about uh, a few items. Uh, the first discussion was a proposal to modify elementary conference schedules uh, beginning next year. And in a nutshell, uh, the discussion, and it was only a discussion at this point, there's nothing being proposed for voting uh, or formal discussion uh, amongst the larger board, uh, but we, we spoke about the pros and cons of moving the conference schedule back to November. When I say back, uh, we moved it from November to December about 12 years ago, uh, which coincided with us moving from a quarter reporting system at the elementary level to a trimester. Uh, but we are seeing some pros and cons to moving it back to the, uh, to the old way. Um, and we are now in a data gathering process because when you think about it, elementary conferences, uh, our primary audience are our parents. So we wouldn't move forward with a recommendation to make a change without input from parents. So our elementary principals are currently developing a uh, survey that will go out to uh, all elementary school parents giving some feedback, uh, not only on uh, the movement of, uh, the potential move of conferences, uh, but also some feedback on student-led conferences. Student-led conferences is a concept that we started 14 or so years ago. Um, we did a lot of surveys on the front end of that. Uh, we haven't done one in a while. So uh, the elementary conference survey will, will touch on both of those items. We talked about some updates to the uh, middle school handbook, uh, particularly in the discipline code and just tweaking really a, a, a couple of items there. Wasn't, uh, we're not looking at a wholesale change of anything. We continued a discussion that we started in policy committee on the area of sin single subject grade acceleration. And what we endeavor is to create just a formal process so we can replicate that with consistency and equity when looking at students who may fit the bill for a single subject uh, grade level uh, advancement. The easiest example of, of that to give, think of a sixth grader taking a seventh grade math course. So we've, we've done it somewhat ad hoc over the years. Uh, but we are looking to pull it in uh, policy. Actually, right before tonight's meeting, I attended a training um, through uh, Iowa University who put together a protocol um, that is a interdisciplinary process to help determine and guide um, uh, school faculty and parents in making really sound and consistent decisions to ensure that's in the best interest of students. It's, it's actually an approach that's somewhat um, comparative to a child study team process, not from an evaluation perspective, but from a multidisciplinary team perspective. So it, it was actually really exciting. I, I signed up for this professional development kind of, we were researching this for the past couple months. I didn't think it was going to be that great thing, but it was absolutely fantastic. So I look forward to talking more about that with policy and, and curriculum. And the hope is in the spring, 
be able to make a, um, a comprehensive recommendation to the board for consideration and approval. Uh, we are intending on running a summer enrichment program uh, this summer. We're currently doing a staffing analysis, so more to come on that. So we talked uh, just uh, briefly about that. Uh, we talked a little bit about the elementary math pilot update, which is going really, really well. Uh, we have uh, heard presentations from all four of the vendors uh, that we're considering piloting next year. So of the four, we're going to select two to pilot. Where we are now in the process, our small group committees are completing uh, their rubric evaluations of each program. Each group will then do a presentation uh, to the whole committee. The whole committee, each individual member of the committee will complete a rubric. So we'll have a small group rubric uh, for each program and then a whole group rubric for each program uh, to help uh, make a data-driven uh, decision about the two programs that we will implement next, to pilot next year. Training will happen this summer uh, with all the groups, uh, which we're excited about. And we anticipate that next month, one of the two meetings, our math uh, steering committee will do a, present, a public presentation to the board about uh, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going with the elementary math program. Uh, we talked about uh, some possible uh, changes to PE requirements uh, at, at the high school. Uh, most specifically, uh, we began a discussion about a potential recommendation, again, nothing formally is being recommended, uh, that all freshmen take one quarter of PE um, in, the, in the future, <laughs> yet to be determined. Again, we're just at the discussion phase of this talked about the impact of the athletics cut policy uh, that was implemented uh, this year and uh, impacts to things like developmental uh, uh, tennis. Uh, we talked about our uh, five-year data run that was presented uh, to the, that was presented at the high school uh, PTA meeting about college projections and SAT scores uh, over the past five years, which are looking uh, very, very uh, good. Um, in fact, let's see if I can, for the sake, I'm, I am not going to do a deep dive into this. I was not planning on doing this, but I do want to share this because I, I think it's worth sharing. So when we look at our it's, overall performance by this slideshow, not share. Yeah, you What's share the slideshow. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Overall performance by score range, and so we're looking at a, a five-year look back period. Um, we are seeing very consistent scores of students scoring in the 1200 to 1390 range uh, over the past five years. We saw a little bit of a dip in 2020 and uh, increases in 21 and 22 in those score areas. Yeah, and Gino, I think one of the other things we talked about was um, kind of summarizing this information because there's a really interesting story here, right? The, the data speaks for itself, 2020, COVID, unsurprisingly, there were big challenges for everybody while we got figuring out a whole new world and a new way of working. But the truth is that our scores have, you know, continued to um, remain really strong. So I think it's it's something, you know, watch this space. There's gonna be a, maybe a more formal communication about that because yes, five years of data and a really strong and impressive story um, is one that we want the whole community to know. And I thought this was a really strong slide when we look at selective college admissions uh, data. Uh, selective college admissions meaning an acceptance rate of 25% or, or below. Um, and the, the ledger, they've heard they multiply by 100, so it's not 0.15%, it's 15%. So I want to clarify that while that fixed up. Yeah, there was, and, and again, there was an intention of making this a public presentation. <laughs> <laughs> just sharing, you know, some, some of the information. We will have something more formal uh, uh, 
coming up in the future. That's good stuff. I mean, I was really <clears throat> surprised in a pleasant way to see how many of our students, I think it was something like a fifth, are scoring in the 1400 range or 700 and above. That's incredibly strong, and I think that speaks well, really well to you. And kudos to Tammy, I believe. Yes. Pulled this all together, so um, she just took the initiative on her own to do that, and that was great. Two, uh, two, two final things. We had a uh, we had a really successful uh, professional development day on uh, what was that Tuesday? Uh, Tuesday surveys going out to our staff, so hopefully the uh, quantitative data will support my qualitative data saying that it was a great day, uh, but it, it was, it was um, very well received. So hopefully that data will bear that out. Uh, and finally, we talked about a, uh, some curriculum materials to uh, pilot in uh, the, the high school social studies uh, classes. And this is, this is really exciting. So this will be on formally for approval next month. Uh, and as promised at an earlier board meeting, um, I am in the process of creating a curriculum page, so all the curriculum items up for approval. This will be the first item up there. Uh, will be detailed uh, for review by the community. And, you know, uh, engagement has been a significant goal of ours uh, for a long time, but a, a, a renewed focus uh, in, this year, particularly when it comes to humanities classes. Um, our teachers are exploring ways to better diversify their, their uh, uh, content delivery. Uh, you know, when you think about a history class, most often the thing we think about is a teacher lecturing in front of the room. So we're looking at more dynamic ways to engage students uh, in that process. And uh, our department facilitator, Jeffrey Bogart, just attended a training last week from the Harvard Business School, something called the Case Method Institute for Education and Democracy. It's a more interactive way uh, and, and using primary sources to uh, teach social studies. For example, uh, the premise of this program is to provide curriculum materials uh, to analyze something in a case in time, like take voting rights. So if the topic of voting rights are being studied, the students have access to primary sources that were available at that time in history, whether it was the 1950s or in the 1960s when the Voting Rights Act was passed. Uh, and based on that and based on societal norms, students uh, analyze those materials and try to understand how those decisions were made in real time based on primary sources. So uh, we're really excited about that. So that, that was discussed. Uh, and again, that will be on for formal approval next week. Thank you for the the off the cuff. <laughs> I have one question for you. Um, what you you had the four vendors uh, do presentations yeah. on on their um, their programs. Have you talked to schools that are using those? Yeah, and I'm sure you have. Yes. Yeah, uh, we had a great meeting today with Cherry Hill Public Schools. One of the programs we're looking at is called Eureka Square. Uh, they are also they already began their pilot. We're getting good feedback from them. We've engaged with Haddon Township. Uh, we've engaged with Princeton Public Schools. <laughs> yeah, so that's all part of uh, all part of this process. So we're excited. It's a great opportunity to collaborate with colleagues because uh, we don't always have the opportunities to do that. So well, that's great. Yeah. I was just going to comment on if your humanities teachers need some inspiration, the Jewish American Cultural Club's power of stories from their experience, I think, is speaks to what yeah, you're great. describing. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I think that was pretty powerful to hear the response thing. to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool that it's all coming together. Better than to, to read it in a book that somebody else wrote about the thing. Right. right? But to hear the actual it's great, yeah, primary source. And you've got nothing for the. <laughs> I, just, I just played my hand. <laughs> uh, Mr. Klaus, do you I, I'm all well set and I have nothing to write. Okay. Um, I don't have anything for the, the board president's report. I think that just one, one thing to note um, we do have a long range facilities plan uh, meeting next week, and there's, it's been kind of quiet, right? Just like oh, all of the, this this activity, and then it's been kind of quiet. Um, but it's because the architects have been doing their thing, and I suspect that this is going to ramp up very, very soon. We've been meeting with them 
several hours, several yeah. like well, all, more than weekly. Yeah. Um, so so that's why. So next week, that way next week's meeting can be more productive. Yeah. Just walk in contact. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're calling before the storm, right? Like. <laughs> okay, so I don't have anything else there. Um, all right, so we will move into public comment. Um, as a reminder, the BOE meetings are business meetings that are held in public. The board welcomes civil, respectful statements to inform its deliberations and welcomes the opportunity to hear citizens' concerns. However, this is not a forum for public debate nor a question and answer session. Members of the community are invited to speak for no more than three minutes about both agenda and non-agenda items. We'll inform, inform you when your three minutes are up, and we'll invite you to get back in line if you'd like to make additional comments. Please state your name and your street. While public education can be an emotional issue, we strive to maintain a certain level of decorum at the meeting. Public meetings are recorded and televised, <coughs> and students often participate in the meetings. As such, citizens are expected to maintain the tone of courtesy and civility. So would anyone like to come up? Or public comment. Hi, Carol Stoner on Avondale Avenue. Um, one question I have for Gino is why the freshmen would need to take a quarter of gym class if they're going to have to do the sport. That's a lot in one day, so that's just something for the future. Um, Mike had said that the OPA requests have cost this district more money. If the board would tell the truth and be transparent, there would not be as many requests. OPA requests are now being filed so that the parents can see what's in the curriculum because there's no other way to be effectively fill out the opt-out form since you have to specify what specifically you want your child to be opted out of. And you can't do that without the curriculum. So since the district refuses to publish the curriculum, the OPA requests are the only way to go. Another instance, this Board of Education denied that the George book, now Melissa, was in the fifth grade English curriculum. An OPA request had to be made to show that this book was in fact there and that the truth wasn't told. I don't think that this board saying that the taxpayers are wasting time and money away from our students, I've heard that twice now for the last two meetings, is appreciated. It has been said multiple times. It is our right as taxpayers to request OPA requests. I would also like to make a suggestion that you take the leftover ESSER funds and hire an elementary school math interventionist that you just denied in your budget because our elementary school students deserve more. Good evening. Uh, in here in Walnut Street. Yeah, I want to talk about this Kingsway Learning Center. I, I don't think it's the proper location, and I think it's uh, way too much uh, money, and I don't think it's going to work out. Um, also, we have a lot on our plate. The commissioners want to buy the Bank of America on Ellison Happens, uh, and Walnut Street, and that's going to cost... Um, Oh, uh, maybe up to three million dollars plus that the whole building has to be refurbished because they want it as a police station. So that's going to be expensive. Um, we're going to have Snowden Avenue, 20 units of affordable housing, and that's going to be expensive. We're, all of this is millions of dollars. And uh, eventually Bancroft, the borough, is going to decide is it housing or whatever is going to be built there? So that's expensive. And then um, the school has the high school, you know, Bancroft area. So we're talking about a big expenses and uh, our taxes will really skyrocket. And it's a shame when that happens and people have to move out, especially if they've lived here for many, many years or they have kids in school and the kids get adjusted to to the school they're attending and they leave their friends. But um, in the New Jersey Penn article, I'm sure you, you all know about this, uh, and in tonight's resolution, I won't name the name of the teacher, but a female teacher is being hired. You'll, it's a resolution you'll probably uh, approve shortly. And she's going to teach from January 19th to June 22nd, which is five, five months. And um, it's not to exceed $25,452. Well, 
just make it 25,000. So that's only five months for half a day of preschool teaching. And uh, we don't have full school days for uh, kindergarten. Now, Superintendent Klaus projected that Kingsway would ha have 400 preschool students. And uh, how many teachers would we need to hire for that? Um, if you have 400 students, is there 20 in a classroom? That would require 20 new teachers. So if we did five months, $25,000 for 20 teachers, it would cost us a half a million dollars a day, a half a million dollars for five months for one half day of school. So then if you have full day now of kindergarten or preschool, that would cost a million dollars, but only for five months. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Go ahead, can I finish? Yeah, yeah, I just want to make sure that there are no other yeah. comments first. Okay. So um, that would be another five months if you want to go from September to uh, um, to January. So uh, you know we're talking about um, two two million dollars for a, a, a school year, and then we have to buy pay, also pay for the teachers' health care and their pensions and more school buses and salary for the bus drivers, and then you're saying that Kingsway might cost 13 million. That's if we get a 35% state funded share of the work. And then these preschoolers, they're gonna go on to middle school and high school, and we have to hire more teachers and pay more pensions. It just, you know, it's like the domino effect. And um, just like, the previous speaker said, um, you know, we're on a, schools are teaching a woke agenda. And you can see right now in high school, we're having the issue of a woke agenda. So I don't know how parents are gonna feel when they have a trans story hour. Places do that. Maybe we don't aren't mandated right now to do it, but other states have it mandated. And, you know, it's difficult. They could have porno children's books. There's issues with that. And, um, and what happens when their four-year-old son says, Mommy, am I a girl? The earlier you get the kids, it's not good because they're, they're being indoctrinated with propaganda. And um, I, uh, we have good teachers, but not all of them. Some are believe in these government schools like what we have, but there's other kindergarten schools. We have Presbyterian school, we have Friends school, we have Christ the King school, we have the, um, uh, what is it, Muster Seed. Um, there are, uh, yeah, Christ the Presbyterian. There's many other <coughs> schools that don't, parents don't have to worry about this woke agenda being taught to their innocent little babies. And I don't think it's the right location. I think it's going to cost way too much money. And um, just like the previous uh, speaker said, uh, I'm very concerned about what curriculum uh, these little ones are going to be taught. Thank you uh, for your time. Oh, and I also just want to mention, you know, last time the meeting, uh, Superintendent Klaus was saying how teachers aren't having trouble hiring teachers and you don't have enough you can't they're not paid enough and so forth and i just want to point out that yeah there is a lot of trouble hiring teachers but the reason the main reason for it is because they did not want to take the covid vaccine and therefore they couldn't teach and um also they didn't want to teach this uh work curriculum they couldn't do it so uh maybe you'd be able to hire more if now that I see you're doing away with the COVID uh, ma uh, vaccine mandate. Thank you for your time. Do we have any other public comment? Okay. 
Um, let's move on to items. One minute. So just as a clarification, in the in the Euro Child Center, the pre-K um, group would be tuition based. So we would be charging tuition for the pre preschool uh, students. That's what would help generate and pay for the teacher salary itself. So that, that's all going to be released out there, but it's not just pure taxpayers on the pre-K situation. It is going to be a tuition-based situation, just to clarify. Well, that's not going to pay for the, uh, I mean, how much are we talking about? That's, I, that's not, I just, yeah. not a discussion. I just want to clarify that point. It's not going to be tax-based. Right. And it's also not 400 new students, because we already have preschool kids that were moving from school, making room in the schools. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. I'm so let's move on to items that. for board for approval. We're, we're, not gonna, we're, we're finished with public comment. We're gonna uh, I know that, but I couldn't hear what you were saying to me. Okay. He's I said that the, 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 we are gonna be charging to, we're gonna be charging tuition for the preschool students, so it won't be a taxpayer burden to pay for the tuition the preschool program. And I asked you how much was the tuition. We don't, we I'm sorry, we're not. That's what I did. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Moving on to items for uh, Board of Education approval. Um, the first is governance, the acceptance of the monthly HIV vandalism violence report, and policy approval, policy 5512, policy 5751, regulation 5751. Policy approval, second reading, bylaws 0152, bylaws 1061, bylaws 0162, policy 2432, policy 2425, policy 4216, policy 5200, policy 5533, policy 8140, policy 8330, regulation 23, 2423, regulation 2425, Regulation 5200, Regulation 8140, 8330, 8420.2, 8420.7, 8420.10, Policy 5530, Regulation 5530, and the approval to abolish Policy 1648.11 and 1648.13. Do we have a motion? Motion. Second. Questions? Mike, do you want to call roll? Ms. Hollingworth? Yes. Mr. Knuckles? Yes. Ms. Paoli? Yes. Vice President Hogarl? Yes. Ms. Panecki? Yes. Dr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Essenbler? Yes. And Ms. Hogue? Um, yes, but abstain on B1. Next, curriculum and special education. Uh, approval of field trips, conferences, travel, and overnight field trips. Resolution to approve HMHS Summer College Essay Course. Resolution between Haddonfield Board of Education and Walsh Legacy to provide homebound instruction. Resolution to uh, between <coughs> Haddonfield Board of Education and Waldock Associates to provide record review. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong <button. coughs> I apologize. Sorry. Okay. Resolution to approve Barbara Williams as an independent psych psychologist to complete evaluations. Resolution to approve the Hovercraft project for fifth graders at Elizabeth Haddon. Resolution between <coughs> Haddonfield Board of Education and Bianca Coleman, Behavior, Behavior Therapy Associates. Resolution between the Haddonfield Board of Education and Waldorf Associates to provide uh, independent Educational evaluation, record review, resolution between Haddonfield Board of Education and Speech Language Associates to provide speech therapy and occupational therapy, resolution between Haddonfield Board of Education and Waldorf to pr provide ind independent educational uh, evaluation services, between Haddonfield Board of Education and Walt's Legacy to provide homebound instruction. Resolution between Haddonfield Board of Education and LearnWell to provide homebound instruction between Haddonfield Board of Education and LearnWell to provide homebound instruction for another student. Between Haddonfield Board of Education and Brookfield Schools to provide homebound instruction. Haddonfield Board of Education and Walsh Legacy to provide homebound instruction. Haddonfield Board of Education and Walsh Legacy to again provide homebound instruction. 
for a student to re receive homebound instruction for four hours a week in math starting February 1st to June by a teacher. Resolution between Board of Education and First Children's Services to provide services for tuition for the remainder of the school year for a student. Between the Board of Education and Speech Language Associates to provide occupational therapy services. Between the Board of Education and uh, Dr. Ellen Trombetta to provide supplemental reading services. Between Board of Education and Burlington County Special Services for a student to attend for the remainder of the school year. For a student to receive virtual homebound instruction. Resolution to revise the contract for speech language services for one day per week. Resolution between Haddonfield Board of Education and Stepping Stones to contract uh, a teacher as a preschool teacher. Resolution for a student to receive homebound instruction by the following teachers. Resolution for a student to receive homebound instruction for the following teachers. Can I get a motion? Motion. Second. Discussion? And to be the summer college essay course, it says the cost is $200 per student. Is that to be paid by the student or is the district paying for that? And do we have procedures in place for any student who might want to take it that doesn't have the funds yes. to Great. And then just another comment um, on S, the occupational therapy services. As someone whose kiddo receives occupational therapy services privately, they are fantastic. And I'm so glad to see that we do have some resources that are providing those services to kids in the district because it makes such a big difference. Um, for kids that are having trouble with, for example, like emotional regulation. The piece is huge for my kid. So, well done. I was curious if there is an increase in hormone instruction. Just felt like a it lot of that. Way. And I don't know. I mean, I know there, I don't know. Uh, like yeah. just, is, is yeah, something so, going on or? So, so the, this, this falls under a state requirement um, and for health related reasons, when a student is going to be out for 10 consecutive days or 20 cumulative days, mm -hmm. the school district is required to provide home services at a minimum of 10 hours per week. Um, so these are all a result of those types of issues uh, to meet our mandate. It does, yeah. it, it, it is a little bit higher. Yeah. Yeah. Any other discussion? Oh, well, with respect to F, just, oh, sorry. Were you pointing at someone else? I, I didn't know if you had a question. Like, no. Okay. No, <laughs> um, with respect to F, the Hovercraft Project, if anyone saw um, Meg and I conferring, we were just saying that that was a super cool project and we're excited to see what that's about. Yeah, kudos to Haddon and uh, uh, Principal Bissinger for championing this. He's really excited about it. What is it? That's cool. All right. Uh, it, 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 it's a STEM project, mm -hmm. uh, and it culminates in this assembly where students program these hovercrafts and get to ride on hovercrafts in school. That's about the extent of my knowledge. Uh, all right. Listen, that was a first sure was when, when, when Jerry brought this uh, proposal forward, Mike was my first call <laughs> <laughs> with the gym to make sure that they give this type of lesson. <laughs> I just get like with my older kid, we get um, engineering subscription boxes. We happen to use Crunch Labs by a former NASA engineer, Mark Robert, and just seeing how engaged she is in learning with these hands off, like we were talking with the case studies, when you've got something tactile that you can touch and really get into, I think that's so important. So well done, Haddon and Haddon PTA. That's great. Okay, good call up. Mr. Knuckles. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Vice President Hubbard. Yes. Ms. Benecki. Yes. Dr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Essenblair. Yes. Ms. Hogan. Yes. Ms. Hollingworth. Yes. Okay, moving on to personnel. All of the following personnel for certified and non-certified staff are recommended by the superintendent. The approval of new personnel transfer, salary upgrades, mentoring, extracurricular, coaching appointments, 
leave of absences and resignations. Approval for Bethany Kirk to support a student during extracurricular activity. Approval for Amanda Light <coughs> and Lauren Hasniak. Hasniak. Ah, sorry. <laughs> to provide supplemental science instruction um, outside of school hours. And approval for Jean Kornack to be paid chaperone rate for um, the following events. Can I get a motion? Motion. Second. Discussion. I have. We will, I want to talk. I want to talk a little bit. We have two retirements, so I'm going to talk a little bit about one. She was about the other. So Julie Smart, um, long time English teacher at the high school. So I came here in 1993 or 94, I think, and Julie was my mentor. Um, so I, I've known her for a long time. I'm not sure she's officially my mentor, but she's the person I ask the questions to, <laughs> and, and, and taught me what Haddonfield was all about. And, and um, then for years, I taught next to her, taught the same courses with her. Uh, she's a great colleague, um, really, 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 really good English teacher. Uh, very, very efficient, very effective, very passionate for it. And she's taken over and been the facilitator of the department for the last several years. She's done a great job leading that department. So um, she's been here a long time. Um, she's going to be <clears throat> dearly missed. Um, I know she's going to be a hard void to fill. I, she's going to take her time. She's got actually uh, her, her daughters or her, her daughters are field hockey players and, and the ball players. She's going to coach. She's going to ref field hockey. She's going to take her time off and do some ref, ref field, field hockey and stuff like that. And, and she spends some, some time with the family. So uh, sad to see Julie go. Happy for her. That I, I know she's excited about this. And so uh, she'll be missed. And hats off to Julie. She's a, like I said, really good teacher, great colleague, and, and a very solid leader in the district. So that's going to be hard to replace. I was glad to see someone filling in for the essay course. Because yes, yes, so that's it. That was, that, she started that course. She created that course a long time ago. She's been teaching AP uh, Lit for years. Really solid, really solid teacher. Beth Herrera is our other pending retiree. So I had the pleasure of working with Beth during my six years as principal of Tatum. Uh, and then again, as a uh, I don't know, the COVID person. I forgot what my official title is <laughs> during that, but I work very closely with the nurses. And, and here's something I need to say about that. Uh, I, I spoke to a lot of colleagues in similar positions uh, in, in during the height of COVID where nurses were leaving the schools. Um, they, they were uncomfortable, or they were uncomfortable doing this, or they didn't want to do that. Uh, Beth was one of those people at the height of COVID it reaffirmed her calling to the health profession. It was not we can't do this, but how can we do this? Beth was always the nurse that worked at our COVID clinics. Beth, uh, Beth was at the forefront of servicing the needs of our students. And again, um, it, it was such an honor to work with Beth and certainly all of the nurses in the school district when we were faced with challenges. And there were a lot of challenges. And it was always about how can we overcome, not why we can't do something. Uh, so Beth has always had that attitude in her, I, 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 I want to say 27 years, something like that in the school district. She's going to be sorely missed, has been a great mainstay at, at, at Tatum, and it's been my honor to work alongside her. Uh, we'll, we'll miss Nurse Herrera. So, you know, I, I have to piggyback on, on Beth Herrera because with my kids going from preschool to graduation, Beth was my children's nurse for 10 years. I interacted with her. Both my kids have food allergies, so I interacted with her a lot on the paperwork and the EpiPens and the Benadryls, and um, she's just fantastic. I mean, she just knew everything about every child that had an issue, and um, she'll leave big shoes to fill. So I just wanted to give her a shout out and thank her for her service. That's great. That's great. Miss Paoli. Uh, yes, but abstain from 3A. Vice President Hogarth. Yes. Ms. Benecki. Yes. Dr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Essenplayer. Yes. Ms. Hogue. Yes. Ms. Hollingworth. Yes. Mr. Knuckles. Yes. Okay, moving on to approval of the following business and finance recommendations. Approval of educational data services to maintain the licensing to participate in the New Jersey Cooperative Bid Maintenance Program uh, for the upcoming year. 
approve the awarding wow. of bid for the toilet room <laughs> renovations <laughs> for Elizabeth Haddon and the Haddonfield Royal High School. Rejection of the bids for the toilet room res renovations at J50 and Tatum Elementary. Uh, approval of the following tuition rates for the upcoming school year. Resolution not to participate in the special education Medicaid initiative program, SEMI. Accept donation from Haddonfield Educational Trust for teacher grants in the amount of $14,804.40. Resolution to approve participation in the attached college university job fairs. Approve the contract with Toshiba for the lease of the copy and printing equipment. Resolution authorizing Haddonfield School District to enter into a cooperative pricing agreement with County of Bergen. Approve the memorandum of agreement between Haddonfield Board of Education and local law enforcement. Recommend the adoption of the tentative budget. Mike, I don't have to read all of that, right? <laughs> um, payment, of, payment of bills, uh, budget transfers, secretary's <coughs> report, cash summary report. That's it. Can I get a motion? Motion. <laughs> Discussion? I think this is touched on magic in the MOA law enforcement. Yeah. So, so um, we had we actually put a resolution together. We, the board put a resolution together that asked me to investigate this because the updated administrative code that went into play last March removed all discretion for the school district, the, the superintendent, what, what had to be reported as far as uh, bias acts. Um, the MOA still has that clause in there. As a matter of fact, you read it, within a paragraph, it contradicts itself. So we were like, this is not, we, how can we, we change our policies to go with the, with the code. Now you're asking us to approve a document that goes, is in conflict or has, this, has discrepancies with our policies and in the, in the code. Um, I talked to the prosecutor's office. We I met with the prosecutor's office, the county superintendent, and the answer is that in the administrative, in the MOA, in the first page, it says that any updates in the administrative code override what's in there. In their mind, that removes the discretion in the code. So they're saying that's not really a discrepancy. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I'm not prosecuting. Um, they are working on updating the MOA. Uh, and it names up in, in the way we put, I probably shouldn't say this because he said, don't tell anyone outside this room this, but he uh, said the attorney general is notoriously slow on these things. So he's not, there's no timetable for when he updated the MOA. Um, but I was not the only, we were not the only school district to raise this issue. It was actually a common question being asked um, by many of the superintendents. We had a meeting, all county superintendents, all county police chief, the prosecutor's office and um, County's executive superintendent. And that was it was an hour discussion on this. And the bottom line was that's where they stand. Um, so that's why it's on there, even though we put the resolution out. Um, we we one of the things you can do is you can modify the state written resolution, but you can't weaken it or go back on it. And I so they're like, well, that would be taking that out. Can add things so you can't take things out anyway. So, so anyway, that's why it's on there. That's the story behind it. Um, they did hear us. They knew enough they had to act on it, and so that's where we're going. Just clarification. Any other discussion? And for Tatum, all the cooperative stuff is to try to get the toilet rooms going. Right? Like we get do we get to do something different now since we've gone out twice for bids no. or no? So unfortunately we wanted to, we were hoping that uh, the, the funds, the ESSER funds yeah. would fund all of these projects. Yeah. Fortunately. We have, we have to pick and choose, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, Tatum had the largest scope yeah. of, of renovations. It was a million dollars all by itself. So luckily we were able to fit two schools within the budget that we have. Um, realistically, our, our plan, our goal is our two in future summers fund locally through capital reserve or maintenance reserve probably um, the rest of the districts. Towards the okay. districts. 
Anyway, I know we talked about this before, but I just couldn't remember when I was downstairs in one of the bathrooms. Is that, I think it's 419, I don't have it on my screen, mm -hmm. for um, the high school bathrooms. Is that all the bathrooms or just bathrooms? No, so B Wing, no, because they, the B Wings, uh, all the renovations from the last referendum touched B Wing, so we're not touching B Wing at all. Um, e Wing, there may be one bathroom from the A Wing, and that's it. The rest is. All the bathrooms in the wing we're sitting in right now. Yeah. Vice President Hoberger. Yes. Ms. Spadecki. Yes. Dr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Essenplay. Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Hogue. Uh, yes, but I'm going to abstain from J. I can't be now. I'm going to vote no. Yeah, here you go. Great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to vote no. Ms. Hollingworth. Yes. Mr. Knuckles. Yes. Ms. Paoli. Yes, and I'll also vote no on that. Okay. Approval of the following minutes. The reorg meeting, January 5th. Regular meeting, January 12th. Exact session, January 12th. Regular meeting January 19th and exec session January 19th. Can I get a motion? Motion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to move this along. There are babies that are on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> discussion. <laughs> okay. Ms. Kodecki. Yes. Dr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Hessenberg. Yes. Ms. Hope. Yes. Ms. Hollingworth. Yes. Mr. Knuckles? Yes. Ms. Paoli? Yes. And Vice President Cooper? Yes. Items for future consideration by the board? I was just wondering for the committee update section, does that have to be identical for the working session and the voting session? Or now that we're like on set, more set schedules, does it make sense to do half and half? Like last meeting was longer because we had some, like, does it make sense to split it or no? Is that not allowed? Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, right, I should, all yeah, of our so, like right. the majority of reports were last time, and I have a feeling it's because of the new meeting I, cycles we're on. So should we spread it? Here? We can look at know? that. It's, it's also um, it's we, we, so like next like next month we're not the third and fourth. We we, oh, we are right. the it's second just, third. Yeah, so it. sometimes the board yeah, meetings okay. fluctuates. We have to look at that. Yeah, we I also have to look at a couple board meeting days coming up. Uh, we did not realize there was a conflict on the May board meeting with. Prom? Is that one of the things? Oh, right. oh, yeah. Right. So we right. want we probably should talk about moving that yeah. um, for two reasons because it's the prom. Yeah. People want to go there. Yeah. And also, you won't be able to get here. <laughs> um, that's that's something to think about. So we reschedule um, December. Yeah. We haven't done that one okay. yet. We're looking at that one too. Yeah, so okay. we, so we, we should look, look at those. We'll have those okay. uh, we'll have those new date suggestions by next month so we yeah. can act on that. <laughs> I think it makes sense. I mean, if I'm understanding you correctly. To have all the committee reports in the work session because a lot of it influences what's on the agenda. Right? It would be but what I, ideal. Would happen be, yes. So that's the only yeah, thing right, that, yeah, you know, we we'll off filter. Yeah. Some of the time. But it's usually they usually don't happen between the work session and this one. Well, committee huh? curriculum was yesterday yeah, and yeah. finance was Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. it makes if, sense. If, if well, we want to do that, we can look at trying to plan that. The working session seemed long, so I'm like, oh, is there a way to distribute this yeah. so that yeah. I have the stamina to really be a good listener? <laughs> really have to say it selfishly. <laughs> the key one is policy. That's the only thing you're almost guaranteed yeah. to get an agenda item on every single time. Yes. Right? So I guess that's what I'm thinking of, right? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> right. yeah, the others, it's discussion and sharing, but you don't just have to get it on the agenda. That's right. why yeah. we can we can look at those types yeah. of things to try to improve yeah. that. And I'm not trying to make it harder, but not just, yeah, just think about it. Okay. Anything else? I actually just just for for the board members, if you haven't completed your financial disclosure yet, do so whenever you can. Okay. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> the county badges me every the single county. week on all the administrators and board members who haven't completed it yet. So, and it's known county wide. So. Just, just a front front. It's funny because I know mine's in, but like I can't. Well, I don't know if I did it or not. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, just so you know, it's not due till the end of April. But yeah. the thing I find funny about school systems because one year I, I started getting badgered. 
by someone here than <laughs> you. But but every single week, and it was in January, and I was like, this isn't due until the end of April. Yeah. Like, what is going on? So I changed yeah. the deadline for every... because April seemed. I was like, I can let it. Go. Yeah. So every Friday from I guess the system opened in January. Every Friday from January to April, the county sends out a status of every every district's financial. Don't they have anything? But like. Do you think I have to be honest, I mean, that makes me want to rebel and just, just wait until like April 19th, I'm going to do it. Just, like, I'm, I'm just agreeing, I'm just agreeing. Like like uh, so but what you're telling like, 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 us is that everyone in the county knows who has this bill. No, I exactly do just numbers, so oh, like if okay. there's 30 we have to do, they know that we've only done Get, That's I not what our numbers are. Yes, I get the bride down business. Yeah, they're done. So we should get on. <laughs> <laughs> <Whatever. laughs> Anything else? <laughs> Move to adjourn. Can I get a motion? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>